Welcome to the David Donham Podcast. Season one is all about steering towards scripture, and I'm so excited for you to hear today's interview with a very special guest. But before we get started, I want to invite you to make sure to listen all the way to the end. We have details about our first ever giveaway on the podcast. It's a teaching DVD from episode three's guest, Dr. Brian Russell, and it ties into his book, Invitation, that we discussed in episode three. I'm very excited for you to hear how you can have a chance to win it. Well, that's enough of the business part. Let's get into today's episode. All right, well, welcome to the podcast, Dr. Karen Swallow Pryor. You've asked me to call you Karen. I'm gonna try my best to do that. But I wanna say welcome. I'm so excited to have you. And really, I've known you through Twitter. I've followed you for a while. I've interacted with you a few times. And you were this person who kind of mentored me by tweet, gave me some um, talking points for engaging leadership and holding them accountable. But something special about you is I remember one day I logged onto Twitter and I saw a tweet, I'm paraphrasing what it said, but it was, this is Karen's husband. She was just hit by a bus and is in the hospital, please pray. And it was this weird sensation of, oh my goodness, something horrible has happened. And I realized like I looked at you as a mentor and as a friend and you became this real person for me in this moment. And I, I realized you have a special place in my heart. So thank you for your tweets and your writings. And I'm so glad you're doing better. Um, I guess it was about a year ago, a little over a year ago, this happened and you're doing good and running. Everything yeah. going good? Yeah, it was a year and a half ago. And so many people prayed for me and I am so grateful to those prayers and to the Lord for preserving my life and limb and I'm doing well today. Yes. Well, that is great. You have written a book that I just devoured called On Reading Well. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. But um, for people who may not know you or just kind of finding this podcast, um, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. I am a professor of English at Liberty University, uh, where I am uh, in my 21st year of teaching English there. Uh, so I live in um, the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in Central Virginia, which is God's country. Uh, and then after um, the conclusion of this school year, I will be moving on to uh, a post as a research professor um, at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, which is very exciting and a little scary. I'm not a person who likes change, but this seems to be of the Lord and his next step for me. So I'm very excited to continue teaching Christian students um, through literature, which I love. Um, as I've, I've said for years, my goal in all of my teaching is to have my students leave the classroom loving life, literature, and God more than when they came in. That's great. That's really good. And just to read some more of your bio, you've written another book called A Booked Literature and the Soul of Me and Fierce Convictions, The Extraordinary Life of Hannah Moore, Poet, Reformer, Abolitionist. Um, you also are a big writer at Christianity Today. Uh, you've written for The Atlantic, The Washington Post, First Things, Vox, Thinking Christian, and The Gospel Coalition. So you got quite the resume. I do enjoy writing <laughs> and reading. <laughs> writing and reading. You do enjoy both. Well, tell us, you wrote this book on reading well. What led you to write this book? Well, having taught English literature for a few decades now, um, of course, I love reading and I want other people to love reading. But what I've noticed over the past several years is that we are seem to be kind of losing our ability to read well. Uh, my first book, which you just mentioned, Booked Literature in the Soul of Me, um, was a book arguing that we should read widely. We should read a lot of books. We should read things that challenge us. Um, but now I'm realizing, even though I still think that we should read widely, that we're struggling to read well. And so that, that's sort of the companion piece to that book is, is we actually need to choose wisely in our reading, which is one way of reading well but also read better than we are. And so there are many, many ways that we can do this. And that's what this prompted this book is to, you know, helping my students, but also helping all the people out there because I have so many people who tell me that they would love to take a class with me. Well, I wrote a book that's kind of like a class with me. All right. And so this book 
I think it's, you said it's kind of the sequel to your first book, but I consider this book a volume one of 10 because <laughs> is, is what you do for people who haven't read the book is you go through a work of literature in each chapter and pull out a virtue. And so for a preacher, this is like, wow, this makes my sermon illustrations a lot easier. So I want you to go through nine more volumes of all great works of literature and contemporary literature and really help out preachers. Well, I will put that on my list. <laughs> I would love to do that. So the Lord perhaps will give me the time to do so. I, I would love to write more books like this. So this book is good because of the way it's laid out, but also just the introduction alone, it's worth sneaking into a bookstore and just reading the intro and walking out. I don't know if that's legal or not. That's not legal advice. Don't do that. Um, but your introduction is this powerful argument for reading. And also you address the struggles of reading. And that's something that I come across a lot as a pastor. I, I think church people, my people probably read more than they ever have, but it's Facebook posts, mm -hmm. it's Twitter posts, it's, you know, advertisements that they come across and see. So describe what the reading climate is and why it's so challenging right now. Hmm. Well, I, I just, I do want to confess and maybe give a little insight into the writing process for people to kind of lift the veil. Um, from, from the, that secret, <laughs> uh, mysterious journey of a writer. Um, I wrote the introduction last um, because, and I wanted the introduction, I, I said this literally to my, to my editor and to myself, I said, I want the introduction alone to be worth the price of the book. Um, and so it's very encouraging to me to hear you talk about the introduction that way. Um, and so, yeah, I think, as you said, we are, you know, we have had about a 500 year run as a literate society. That literate society came about um, because of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, so this is our, you know, this is our heritage as, as Christians that we brought literacy to ourselves and to the world, of course, to read the Bible first, but then lo and behold, we could read a lot of other things and write things and publish things. Um, but we're now in a place where we are so inundated with, with words um, but they're short words, they're brief words, they flash across the, the screen um, that we're reading very superficially, we're reading very quickly, and we're getting a lot of information, but we're not really d doing the deep reading, the meditative reading. Um, I mean, I just had, this happens all the time, but just yesterday on Twitter, um, someone tried to correct my grammar on a tweet because she had actually misread what I wrote, which is so easy to do, and I'm not, I'm not faulting her, um, but she had, we read so quickly on Twitter and she thought that I had used the wrong case of a pronoun because she misread the word had as and so easy to do. And we do it all the time because we read so quickly and carelessly. I am very bad at that. There's several <laughs> tweets I delete and just redo it or message friends. And I, I will say in defense of, of typing things incorrectly, autocorrect, I don't, I think it's oh, more of a curse than a blessing. Right. Oh, I, I agree. And, and we're, we're typing quickly too. And it is Twitter. And I don't, you know, I, I don't fault anyone for making those kinds of mistakes on Twitter. I make, I make them more than anyone. But again, it, it, it shows us where we are with our reading. We are far, far removed from, um, you know, the, the readers and writers of the 17th and 18th century who read thick, long books with convoluted sentences and um, that just required so much attention and meditation and reflection. You bring up the topic of, or the challenge really, to read virtuously. To you, what does it mean to read virtuously? Well, this, there are so many ways that I mean that, and hopefully I explain them all well in the book. But first of all, to read books that show us a vision for the good life. Um, often they show us that through negative examples because you know it, it, stories about perfect people and perfect worlds are boring. So we often get by negative example, complicated characters and complicated situations who make some right decisions and make some wrong ones. And through that, we can learn, we can learn, uh, we make judgments as we read a story we judge we're, we're going along with the character and, and and making a decision oh this person should do this the person should not do that so we are cultivating our own moral agency and our uh, ability to um to choose between good and bad and better and best um and that's a practice in virtue but also in order to read well we actually need to practice a lot of the virtues as i was just talking about um 
we don't read virtuously on Twitter very often because we're reading quickly. Uh, we are, we respond quickly. Reading virtuously in this sense means to read slowly, patiently, reflectively, asking questions, um, listening, to use that term metaphorically, you know, listening to what is being written, uh, you know, as we, as we ponder it, rather than being quick to respond um, or, you know, or, or argue or debate, reading to understand. Um, and I would say of all those things, the thing that what most of us struggle with today, myself included, um, is reading slowly, just stopping, slowing down and really making sure we understand and reflect on the words. Um, I think that's the biggest virtue um, that we need right now. Yeah. And that's not just true for, you know, literature. I mean, which the Bible is literature, but also reading scripture. It's, it's so hard. And we'll talk about this a little bit more if we have time, but just to slow down and read, you know, a proverb instead of trying to read it at the speed of yeah. what you read a tweet to. So, so you've been a professor for how long now? Is it 19 years? I have been at Liberty for, this is my 21st year, but I actually began teaching college as a graduate student 30 years ago. Okay. So you've gone from this time. I was only five. You were five years old when you started. <laughs> you are a child kidding. prodigy. <laughs> but it's been, thir I've been teaching college for 30 years. You've been teaching for 30 years. You've seen students come in carrying no yellow legal pads <laughs> to having laptops, to having cell phones. How has technology changed uh, the way you teach, the way you engage in students, and the way they learn? Hmm. Yes, I've definitely seen a lot. Um, I would say in some ways, you know, it, it hasn't changed in terms of students come in having some knowledge and some experience and some cultural uh, references and framework that might be different from mine and, and it's a matter of trying to understand one another. My teaching philosophy has always been to meet students where they are and take them where they should be. Um, and so that process has not changed. Uh, but I do see that students, the biggest changes are that they come in less able to read well, um, less willing or able to put the time in outside of class that's required to do well in class. Um, some of that is because they are, are doing so many other things, whether it's activities or jobs, but much of it is just because uh, of expectation that they just um, don't realize the old rule that you're supposed to put in two hours outside of class for every hour inside of class. Um, and and they, they take so many classes, whether in high school or even continuing at college where there's a lot of busy work in checking off boxes and there's less emphasis on them, you know, learning alone by reading and reflecting and taking notes and studying. Um, it's just a different, it's a different world. So they, as I talk about in one part of the book, um, learning and studying is kind of like exercising a muscle. Um, and so students who have not exercised that muscle for a long time or for their whole lives can suddenly feel like putting in 20 minutes outside of class is a lot, um, but it's not. And the, so their expect, expectations are very different. Um, the expectations placed on them are different. So therefore they um, behave according to expectation. And I just, I try to keep my expectations high. I thought that was more of a suggestion the, for every hour in class. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. And, and I, I love that example you used in the book. I think you actually said if a student studies for 20 hours and they say, I'm going to study just one more hour before the test, it's nothing. But right. if it's a student who hadn't studied at all and they're like trying to, it's going to be like pulling out their hair. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be like Chris Farley and Tommy Boy when he tries to take the test and it's just going nuts trying to come up with the answers. And so it is, it, it's, it's a muscle for sure. Well, and, it, and, and all virtues are. This is the whole idea of what virtue is. Virtue is something that you, it, it, it starts out as a practice and then it becomes a habit and then it becomes so natural to you that you don't, it, it's part of your character and you don't even have to make a choice to be virtuous because you've become virtuous. All right, so I could discuss each chapter of your book. My favorite chapter was the Great Gatsby, a story I read in high school and have used as sermon illustration several times. But to be faithful with our time, I want to discuss and focus on chapter nine. The story you discuss in that chapter is Pilgrim's Progress, and you talk about the virtue of diligence. 
And on page 180, you're discussing about sloth. And most of the time when we think of sloth, we actually think of the animal uh, or something moving really slow. Mm -hmm. But you actually say this, um, sloth stops us from seeking God. And that means we do not find him. And I think you're quoting Thomas Aquinas there. Mm -hmm. And you go on to say, paradoxically, then the busiest people can be the most slothful. Frenetic activity can be what most um, effectively keeps us from what we are supposed to be doing, particularly seeking God and his righteousness. Being busier is easier than being good. Why do you think we struggle with sloth and the busyness of sloth? Well, I think um, this, is, this is part of our culture. We are such a busy, hurried, harried age, right? That, that is the definition of, of this late modern life. And so I think it's a struggle for all of us. I mean, when you read that last part um, that I wrote, um, being busy is easier than being good. I mean, I wrote that for me. <laughs> I'm a busy person and it's so easy for me to be busy and to stay busy. Um, and it can keep us from God because, because sloth, again, we think of, as you mentioned, the, the animal, but the etymology and history of the word actually points out that it's not just slowness and laziness, Sloth is actually carelessness, like in the literal sense, like not caring, kind of that boredom and um, angst and just sort of, oh, I don't care, whatever. I mean, there's a reason why whatever is the catchphrase of our time, because it's actually a reflection of our lack of caring. Uh, and there are many reasons why it's easy not to care in this age. There are so many so many serious, pressing, controversial, horrible things going on. Uh, we, it's easy to just kind of retreat into ourselves, but it's to also just as easy to keep busy. So we don't have to address those things. We don't have to do the hard, intimate, slow work of relating with one another, um, relating with God and our neighbor. So in a way, this may be the vice of the age, right? It's, it, it's, it's sloth. Um, not caring. Um, and busyness is a way of not caring because it's so easy to, to keep busy without thinking much. Um, at least it is for me. And so uh, when we slow down and we care and we pay attention the way we should, um, that's when we can begin to be diligent, which is the virtue that's the opposite of sloth. So I don't think there's a single person who will listen to this and not be able to relate to that what are some ways for us to slow down? Hmm. Well, we have to be intentional about it for sure. Um, because it's our default mode for most of us today is to be busy. So we have to first decide um, that we want to slow down. Um, and we obviously can't slow down everything in our lives. So perhaps we want to build in some practices where we set aside a certain amount of time of day to do something like read or talk with the people that we live with. Um, or it might be something more like even in our busyness, slowing down to pay attention um, to what we're doing, to be mindful about what we're doing. Um, this is something, it's so easy to go into automatic mode and not really pay attention. And attention is a kind of care and a kind of love. And so simply by paying more attention, we're actually being more careful and more diligent. Uh, and so even in our busyness, we can perhaps do that. So why is it important for somebody who says they follow Jesus to be diligent? And I think you kind of hit on a little bit, but let's flesh it out and apply it directly to the Christian faith. Why is it important for us for to slow down and have diligence? Well, it's certainly the Bible talks about diligence a great deal. The Proverbs are filled with, um, with not just the idea, but even the word of diligence, um, you know, when it compares uh, the ant and the grasshopper, for example, um, and the verse that I use to open um, this chapter on diligence is Hebrews 6.11, which says, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit 
the promises. Now, there are some other virtues built into that verse, um, that passage, including faith and patience, which I talk about in other chapters. But the Bible tells us that the Christian faith, the Christian walk, the Christian journey is one that is to be marked by diligence. And we know that because it's not always easy. And we see people around us every day who are abandoning the faith, um, who are leaving the church. Um, and that's an easy thing to do. The hard thing is to stay faithful, to stay diligent. Um, to, and, and that means the other, the other thing that is um, marks, I think, this age is not just abandoning the faith or leaving it, but the opposite extreme of constantly looking for the mountaintop experiences, the excitement, the, you know, the big crowds, the number of decisions made, um, the affirmation. Um, but the diligence is found in the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, the day-to-day -day grind, the day-to-day -day faithfulness, the times when we don't see abundant fruit for our labor and uh, we don't know what God is doing in our lives. We're to be diligent then. Wow, that was great. And that's so true for Christians that there is a big part of it that it's almost easy to be a, a Jesus follower when you're at the big concert or the numbers are high, like you're saying, but what about those times in between? And that's something that's not only needed, but it's, it's hard to do. And it gets, it's harder. I don't know if I'd say it's harder in this culture than throughout church history, but it definitely has its own unique challenges. Yeah, unique challenges is a good way of putting it. I mean, we're not being burned at the stake and martyred right now in America. Uh, other Christians around the world are. Um, but that doesn't mean that the challenges that we face of competition and, and seeing people in social media who are, you know, are, are seem to be living these amazing lives for the Lord. Um, it's, it's easy to just fall into um, comparison and, uh, and judgment of ourselves. And, and that's a trap. That's a temptation. Uh, and we're called to be diligent. Yeah, it doesn't make a good Facebook post to be like, check me out being diligent today. And, you know, it's just you sitting still, <laughs> you know, praying. Absolutely right. It's not a good post. <laughs> All right. So we've talked about reading and we've kind of moved over to talking explicitly about the Christian faith. Let's talk about diligence in reading the scriptures. Why is that something important for us to consider? Well, uh, it like any kind of reading or any kind of practice, the more that we read it, the more faithfully that we do so, and the more care and attention we put into it, the more um, fruit is going to be born in, in, our, in our walk and in, in uh, the lives of those around us that God allows us to minister to. Um, reading the scriptures, you know, can be hard. It can be boring. It can be something that gets pushed aside in the busyness of day to day. Um, and I really like what you said earlier. Um, and maybe it was before we were recording, but the idea of, of slowly reading a proverb meditatively, reflectively, as opposed to just kind of speeding through. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the whole read, reading the Bible in a year um, approach. And, and that can be good. It kind of just like a, a, a sprint. Um, but there's also a way of reading the Bible that's more like the marathon, like you're just in for the long haul and reading it slowly and immersively and meditatively to get more out of it. Yeah, I don't know of anything more challenging than trying to read through the Bible in a year because it's it's so hard to, you know, get through certain passages and not feel like you're just speed reading, which is what right. we're kind of encouraging people not to do. Exactly. And then you start feeling you know, less accomplished because you sped red. And so it's like, uh, I don't know, it needs a lot of grace. I like how you talk about how you're kind of talking about how we should compare ourselves to others readers. And you say a diligent approach to reading means one thing for the seminary student, another for the man with heavy work responsibilities and five children at home. And I think that's so important because so many people that I encounter in my current ministry context, you know, they love Jesus, they serve the church, um, but they say, I just don't like to read. I don't like to read scriptures. And so um, I, I think one of the barriers can be, you know, I'm not going to be able to sit down and just read all day like the preacher does, or I'm never going to be a biblical scholar. And so I appreciate you for saying that. And I just want you to flesh that out a little more. Why do you think it's important for us to be graceful with whatever reading level we're at? Well, again, we need to remember that we are in this 500-year chunk of time in human history where we're reading culture. 
the Christians of the first and second centuries, the, the, the masses of them, I'm not talking about the people who wrote the letters of the Bible and who led the church, but most of the people in, in the early centuries of the church couldn't read. They didn't read. They didn't have the scriptures, yet they were faithful Christians. Um, now, it's, it's easier to be a faithful Christian when we have the scriptures, and that's why it's important to hold on to them and to hold on to the gift of reading. But we have to remember that, that people are, are in different times and places and cultures, and that includes our own. And so diligent reading really needs to be something that we measure for ourselves in our context. Um, I just re recently met someone um, at a, an event where I spoke um, who reads three to five hours a day. Uh, and I'm an English professor and I was really jealous. <laughs> he sets aside the time to do that every day. And I think that's wonderful. Um, but even as an English professor, I don't have the luxury of doing that in my job. And so if, you know, so for him being diligent means something different because he's able to build that in. Diligence for him is five hours instead of one hour. Um, for me, diligence looks, you know, different depending on whether I'm grading or class prepping and for, you know, the mom of six kids or the dad uh, who's a preacher uh, and bivocational, it's, it's just different. And so um, that, that's what I love about the virtues and I love about um, the wisdom that the Bible offers us. We are all in a different place and we have different responsibilities. And um, before God, that's, you know, we, we do what we can, including what we can with reading. Yeah, a lot of people think professors have time to sit around and read, but <laughs> from my limited experience with seminary professors and college professors, that's just not the case. <laughs> of course, if I spent less time tweeting, I'd have more time reading, but <laughs> tweet, tweeting is like my, my entertainment, so um, we have to build that in, too. <laughs> That's, uh, that's very, and you're very entertaining on Twitter also. <laughs> All right, pulling back and jumping back into reading. Um, you say practice makes perfect, but pleasure makes practice more likely to read. So read something enjoyable. Um, I, so you got somebody who says, I'm inspired by, you know, hearing this interview, or they just come to you off the street and say, hey, I don't find reading pleasurable. What kind of suggestions would you give them to start? I love that question. I mean, there are so many good books out there um, that I just encourage people, you know, find a, a list. They're all over the internet. I don't offer such lists because somebody will be get mad at me about something that I put on or left off. Um, but there are great lists all over the internet um, of, you know, uh, the hundred classics, best classics to read, ask people who are more well-read. And, and again, we're talking about classic literary works here, not just, um, you know, Stephen King, which I listen to Stephen King on Audible when I'm running. That's, that's entertainment as well. But when we're talking about a good work of literature, like a, good, a classic novel or a, a beautiful poem, um, there are many things uh, out there to read. And so read something that does grab your attention and interest. Now, it shouldn't just be something easy and mindless like the Stephen King novel. It needs to be something that is challenging um, that forces you to slow down and think, but that should be pleasurable. Um, and so, and, and maybe pick up something that is not really long, just to give yourself a, an opportunity to, to have the accomplishment of finishing uh, something like The Great Gatsby. It's a, it's, it's a short novel. There's a lot in it. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not everyone's favorite. People tend to either love or hate The Great Gatsby. To me, it's one that grows with me each time I reread it. Um, there are just so many ways to enter into good literature um, that it's almost like, you know, I hear this advice given to people seeking therapy. Um, if, you, if, you, if you're getting therapy and, and the counselor isn't, it's not working, find a different, find a different counselor, right? Um, it's the same with literature. I mean, we should give some commitment to it and try to persevere and be diligent, but there's so many good books out there. Just, just get some, pick up one that you're going to take pleasure in. I think of Mice and Men's a pretty short read too. That might be another good. Uh... That is, I love, of course, I love dark literature. Uh, my, uh, Mice and Men is pretty dark, but that, I think it's, but it deals with really important questions that are just as important today, I think. Um, maybe even more important. That is a great suggestion. Good, good for you. A plus for your 
suggestion. Wow, saying. my first A plus ever. <laughs> All right, so let's apply that same question to the Bible then. Let's say somebody walks up to you on the street and they say, okay, I'm ready to start reading and I want to start reading scriptures. Um, and I love Jesus, but I just don't find reading the Bible pleasure. Maybe they started in Levit Leviticus or something <laughs> crazy like that. But what advice would you give somebody starting to really seriously and slowly read the scriptures? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, of course, the Proverbs are great um, and the Psalms because they are rich and deep and, and this, both of them, especially, but the Psalms are poetry. I think sometimes we forget that the Bible is filled with beautiful genres of literature. And so we can read the Psalm because I, I actually suggest to people if they don't feel like they can commit to a classic novel, pick up a good book of poetry and you can't really do better than the Psalms. I mean, read them for the theological depth and wisdom, but also read them with attention to the language and the beauty of them. And you are getting a literary education when you pay attention to those things. They are beautiful, beautiful pieces of poetry. So I would say start there. And um, again, because it's a little bit more poetic, my favorite gospel is John. Um, so again, you know, all of the gospels give the same message, but in, you know, slightly different different angles and ways and so you you can get the richness of the story from any one of them but if you want a little bit more of a literary experience then i would say um begin with john uh, my favorite book is ecclesiastes which probably says a lot about me so if you if you kind of like that dark existential wonder read ecclesiastes everything is meaningless <laughs> No, those are great suggestions. As a student pastor, I would always encourage people to read, especially boys, to read the Proverbs because those are Twitter link, you know, things yeah. to read, but you can read actually slow. And there's one for each day of the month. So don't worry about where you are. Just jump in. You know, you don't have to read them all in order necessarily. Um, although there's some interesting research about the order that they're in. But uh, I, I think those are great advices. Find something, you know, don't probably reading from Genesis to Revelation might be the, one of the hardest way to re read the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are all great suggestions with Proverbs, the Psalms, or starting out in the Gospel of John. So I want to switch gears and talk to you about your reading habits. You've been a lifelong reader. Um, you've always enjoyed reading um, ever since you were young. Am I correct on that? I think you talked you, about you, it. You're book. correct, yes. How have your reading habits changed um, over the years? Oh, this is, this is a, this is a, uh, a sad, <laughs> sad chapter in my, in my life. Um, like everyone else, I am finding that the busyness of life and the prevalence of social media in my life is shortening my attention span. It's making it more difficult to, to focus. Um, so I'm having to be more intentional about setting aside time, putting my phone in another room shutting down my laptop and sitting down and reading. I haven't yet been able to do that this uh, Christmas break, which hasn't quite started for me. I'm just finishing up grading. Um, but I mean, I was blessed enough to grow up in a world before we had cell phones, before we had the internet, when I could sit with a book all day long, literally, um, and read. I carried books with me everywhere. Um, when I was a girl, when I was in high school and college. Um, my husband to this day teases me about the time that we went to see the Buffalo Bills play and I brought a book and read the whole time. <laughs> um, but you know, it was the Bills. Who would blame me? Um, no. <laughs> um, but I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I'm from Buffalo. Go Bills. Um, but uh, you know, so I'm, st I'm struggling in the same way I think many other people are struggling. So again, it just means that I have to be more intentional. Um, on the other hand, all that time that I spend on, on Twitter and social media, I get directed to some of the most fascinating articles and ideas and essays. So in many ways, my world has expanded. It's gotten wider and broader, and that's a good thing. I just have to um, try to maintain that the balance by giving time for me to go deeper uh, and more richly into longer works. Um, and it just, you know, the struggle is real for all of us, including English professors. And you kind of touched on it a little bit of saying you read, you get different stuff from Twitter that you wouldn't normally get. And that's when every time I'm ready to quit Twitter, you know, I think of something you've shared that's meant something to me or challenged me. Um, how do you balance, because you really have these four different categories. You need to read um, professionally for your job. 
-hmm. you need and, and grade I mean, you need to read for your spiritual formation. You need to read literature for your own pleasure. But then also, because you write so many current event type articles, mm -hmm. you've got to read a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. other articles too. So how do you try, what are you doing? Are you just grabbing, you know, uh, an iPad and scrolling through news stories? Or how do you kind of order your reading on, on an average? Nobody ever has just their average day how it goes. Mm -hmm. They want to. But what do you try to accomplish? Yeah, I wish I were more intentional and um, and uh, and <laughs> had a, had a method or a pattern. I don't. I, so it's really the you know my I'm, overall my life does have a rhythm, and I think I just fall into that natural rhythm as I'm preparing for classes. I'm reading or rereading the works that I'm going to teach. So I do that as I'm preparing for classes, as I'm relaxing or procrastinating grading or preparing for classes I'm scrolling through Twitter feed usually on my phone um, and then when I have breaks um, so so the spiritual formation reading and the kind of cultural reading go together I think because that for me is more of my entertainment time uh, and my because it is because I enjoy reading those things so it's entertaining to me um, but when I have breaks come up um, that's when I, I'm intentional about reading the literature that I love, that it just, you know, it, which is good literature, but it also is what brings me joy. And so, um, you know, whether it's in the summer when I'm floating in the pool, I'm reading, or I'm, I'm, I will soon, probably today or tomorrow will begin. I will put my everything away and pick up a book that I'm going to read just for fun. Um, great, great work of literature. I'm going to reread Little Women. Um, and so there's a natural rhythm that goes along with the academic year more than the day-to-day -day because every day is so different. And I think that's something to, for all of us to kind of think about, look at the lives that we have and how can we organically um, build in things that, that, that fit what we already have going, but maybe just bend and flex it and shape it a little bit better. Yeah, that's great advice. And one of the things you keep saying, you talked about bringing the book to the Bills game, and now you talk about floating in the pool and reading. But that's one of the things you actually say in your book, I believe, of just take a book with you wherever you go and just doing that only discipline of just having a book close to you. You know, I'm surprised how much time I have to read, not a lot, but like two or three, you can sneak in two or three pages here, especially if it's a novel and you can just pick up the story. And so I think that's a good practice you have. One of the, one of the things I've, uh, I, I do not enjoy traveling at all. Um, and I travel a lot. And so I have, um, you know, often I, I've tr sometimes I'm preparing my talks and papers while I'm traveling. So I've, I've actually tried to get those out of the way and done and use the time on the plane in the airport to read a book that has nothing to do with my work um, or my teaching. And so I, I've come to enjoy traveling more because I've done that for myself, bring a novel that I haven't gotten to. Um, and treat myself to that time away where I don't have my phone or the internet um, on the plane and just read. So I got a quick personal story. Um, I had a panic attack maybe like seven or eight years ago trying to fly. I'd flown before and I just wouldn't get on the plane. And this uh, past October, my mother uh, very generously flew me to New York for her 60th birthday. But she said, I'll, I'll pay for the ticket if you actually get on the plane because she didn't think I would. And one of the books that I took with me to comfort me, though, was your book on reading well. Now, I was oh. extremely too nervous to read it or open it, but I had it with me, like, oh. in my hands, so in my very oh. sweaty hands. Oh, that, that, I am so touched by that. Thank you. I think I understand the whole the flying is just not fun these days. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a different experience for sure. All right. So kind of my last general question for you is, is there any other advice you would give people wanting to become a better reader or how to improve their reading of scripture or reading skills in general? I think the biggest advice that I would give them, which is advice I'm, you know, giving myself is to don't be daunted by the idea of like, oh, I'll never get through this book or it's going to take me forever or, you know, people who say they read 50 books a year or something like that. If you just set aside 10 or 15 minutes every day to read the Bible or to read a novel or read a, you know, a book of poetry, um, you will be a, it will enlarge your vocabulary, your thinking, your language. It'll ease, it'll give you peace to your mind. It'll slow things down. 
every few minutes that you can devote every day to that kind of slow, immersive reading will improve the quality of your life and improve your reading skills. Um, so you will read by the end of the year, you will have, will have read that much more than if you didn't read a little every day. Awesome. Well, that was a great conversation. Usually that's the end on most podcasts, but we actually have our final five questions that we ask each guest. Are you ready? I hope so. All right, here we go. What is your favorite book you have read outside of the Bible? Okay, it's hard for me to choose, um, but I'm going to pick Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, which is not a girl story or a romance. It is actually the story of a Christian soul in the modern world, and everyone should read it. All right. What is your favorite spiritual formation practice? You know, I... I, this is, I don't even know if this is an official practice, but I'll just share that this is something that I do a lot in different um, circumstances. I meditate and repeat a great deal of the Lord's Prayer. I love the Lord's Prayer, and I love meditating on it, and um, it's, it's a beautiful poem, really. I think it's, even though it's not officially a poem, I think it's poetic and powerful, and I love to, to repeat it and meditate on it. Uh, that's absolutely a spiritual formation practice. I would definitely agree that that's one. All right. Who is the early church father or theologian you would most like to have a conversation with? Oh, yes. I was thinking about this because, um, and I, and I, <laughs> it's really hard for me to choose. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to choose not a, a church father or official theologian. Um, I'm going to choose Hannah Moore. Um, I wrote a book about her, but she was an 18th century abolitionist and reformer. Uh, she, but she wrote a great number of theological books. So I guess I, she really was a theologian, even though it's not official. We, and I we, we count that as a theologian. Okay, yeah. okay, so Hannah Moore. Good, all right, favorite vacation spot? My home. Now, what are you going to do with your home when you, oh, you're going to work from home, right? I, I will be commuting to Southeastern at least for the next um, several years uh, until my husband can retire. And um, so we're keeping our home here. Um, I, I travel a lot for work. And so um, I, there's no place I would rather be when I'm on vacation than home. Awesome. And then uh, I kind of know where you might go with this because you talk about it some in your book, but what advice would you give to your younger self? You know what, I, 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 in my book, I say um, I would urge myself to be patient, more patient with a lot of things, and that, that's part of it. But I think um, another piece of advice that I would give, which also has to do with patience, is um, to worry about things less, to buy fewer things, um, and to invest in relationships and experiences um, and not so much accumulation of things. I have a lot of things now. <laughs> now that's good advice. That's something we could all think mm -hmm. about too. So thank you for that. Well, Dr. Karen Swallow Pryor, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. It was a delight. Thank you for having me, David. Okay. Have a good day. Hey, congratulations on making it to the end of the podcast. I am very excited to announce that we have a brand new copy of Dr. Brian Russell's teaching DVD called Invitation. It's jam-packed with all his lessons that tie into his book, Invitation, the same name as the DVD. So if you want a chance to win this, here is what you need to do. On whatever streaming platform you're listening to this on, go and write us a review. And then email David Donnan podcast at gmail.com. Again, that's David Donnan podcast at gmail.com and tell us what your name is and what your review was. That's because sometimes on the way that you write reviews, we can't always tell who exactly was the person to write the review. So let us know by emailing us. Once we get to 10 reviews, we'll draw a name and announce the winner on that next episode. Hey, if you're finding value in these episodes, please share them with a friend personally or on your social media. Thanks for listening. 
and we'll catch you next time on the David Donnan Podcast.